Hey guys, so preparation for lesson three, which is going to be three axis um, simultaneous. So X, Y, and Z all moving at the same time, <coughs> which I expect in our usage scenario is not going to be as prevalent as what um, regular two or two and a half axis pathing would be. So the item we're going to cut, and I'm going a little bit backwards with this tutorial. I've already cut the part, okay? What we're going to do is I'm going to share some photos of the outcome of that part during all the pathing preparation so we can see where I went wrong. And I did go wrong for sure. And then how to avoid those mistakes when we move forward. Now bearing in mind it's been quite a few years since I cut anything in anger on a machine. All right, so the model comes from here. I'm going to leave this Rhino open because it supports sub D. Um, you, not important for you guys to understand what that's all about, but um, I need to be able to extract curves from here so that we can create containment areas for our path. All right. So in in most cases with most machines, um, it will require some kind of curve to say that you know the cutting area we're working in remains within this curve. Okay. When you use applications like Desproto, um, AlibraCam, those kind of things, it still requires a curve. In some instances, uh, also with RhinoCam, you can say that I want to work with only this surface, and I want to machine this surface, um, which on either a four or five axis incantation can be quite useful to say that I want to machine this surface and I want a strategy that moves kind of with the surface or offsets the surface, etc., etc. We'll get to that in a minute once we get to the next part of the tutorial. But for now, just so that we can move on with the tutorial, I've already got it completely prepped here um, with all its steps. Okay. Um, but you can understand where I got this curve from to say that we're working within this area. Okay. Different CAD, different CAM. Some of the CAM applications have an ability to offset the outside of an article automatically. So just because in our scenario, in, in jewelry, mostly work gets done in Rhino, I'm in the sub D mode, subdivision modeling mode, and I'm saying that I want to work with the edges. So I'm going to go in here and click any one edge of the outside. Oopsie. Any one edge of the outside, double click it, and all the edges that kind of line up with that edge are selected for me. So very quickly I can find the outside of a curve. So the command to duplicate that into an actual curve is duplicate edge. Sorry, I'm working on my gaming machine, so just bear with me. Dupe edge. Okay, so there's 110 sub D edges I added to that selection and they were turned into a series of curves. So you got all these curves here, but they're not all the same. So we're gonna sell curve. Press enter, we've got all the curves selected, and we're going to press join. Yeah, my, my bad. It's already one, one curve. Uh, it's two curves there, my bad. Curve segment. Oh, it's multi selecting, my apologies. So I've got to fix this up. So in Rhino, you have the ability to select sub objects or entire objects. In, in this case, I don't want to select sub objects, I want to select the entire curve, all right? So it was already done for me. So I should be able to grab just that curve. Now I've got one contiguous curve that follows the outside of this item. I'm going to work in the top view so it's easier. We're going to be cutting this with a 0.5 millimeter ball end. Um, and let's imagine I'm just cutting it out of a flat surface instead of a, a tapered surface like I'll show you in a minute. So your command would be offset. We want to offset this curve. Whoopsie. We want to offset this curve through a mouse movement. And I like to keep the corners nice and smooth, but you can change that option on your, on your command line as you see fit. And I like to put a little bit of space. So in, in jewelry terms, we normally cut this kind of stuff from wax, and we like to leave a little bit of space over there to allow for a saw blade to get in and pierce this part free from the stock, from the wax stock. I'm going to work with that for now. And then that's how I made a, a containment curve to say that everything I want to work with lives inside of this curved area. Okay. I'll leave this model open so we can look at it a little bit later. It's a Witcher model. It's available. I drew this... Um, in sub D just to see whether I still understood Rhino 7 sub D, but moving on. Um, <clears throat> you have exactly the same model here. I'm going to select something else so we don't see the tool paths. 
all I did is uh, convert the sub D into NURBS so that I have um, NURBS to work with. You can see the same offset curve over there. And I lofted a little bit and I created a flat surface for us to work within because I want to do some flat machining, some 3D machining and some profiling and explain all of them through this through this video. So let's have a look at the outcome of this and then we'll discuss how I chose to do it. And it'll become immediately apparent that your choice of methodology on how you cut is nearly as critical as what are you cutting. Okay, and the outcome can be wildly varying. So let's bring this over so that it's inside the recording. So this physical part I will give to you guys to examine in that lesson. It's lying on my desk somewhere. Um, but this was the raw cut after machining of that same item. So let's kind of put it there and you can see that this is what we machined. I also chose in this instance to only use one tool to cut the entire thing. All right, the 0.5 millimeter tapered ball end. There's a far more efficient way to do this uh, path with multiple tool changes, changing from a bigger tool down to a smaller tool, etc., etc. Um, I wasn't able to watch this cut while I was away on Sunday, so I just left up to one tool to do the entire thing. Um, all right, so let's examine this video, and I'm going to pause it and bring it back. So you can see that there are expectations of what it should look like for a jewelry piece like this, which is. 25 millimeters across this is ample finish okay it looks great to the human eye it looks great but under microscope you can start to examine things that could have been done a little bit better when we wrote these paths you can kind of see in this video there's there's lines that are there's lines that are coming up here you can see the contours from the method that I've picked and you can see a slight it looks a little bit dodgy around about this area underneath the mouse and I'll go into the that in a second. All right, I'm going to pause that and come back to this. So, first things first, as per the 2D video, you've got the same setups. All right, you've got the machine, you've got the the um, post processor, and you've got your stock that you had to set up to be able to work with this. Um, and then, of course, you have your model. In this case, uh, because I'm cutting straight down from the surface, I wanted to make sure that the top surface was perfectly flat. So as per the last video, I did a two and a half axis facing, not a lot to go through over here. Um, it's just, a, it is covered in the last video. All I'm doing is making sure that my top surface is 100% straight. And you can see that when I did this, if we compare those tool path lines to the lines on the surface over here, you can tell that I also have a machine problem. My spindle is not set up 100% perpendicular to um, the XY plane. So the edge of my cutter is leaving a very slight mark. Now, if you wrote in your finger over that, it's perfectly smooth, but visually you can see that I've probably got a point something of a degree angle issue in my alignment on my machine. And so a cutter that's perfect and or there's another problem, it could be the cutter that has an actual issue, but highly doubtful, probably an alignment issue in my machine because it hasn't been turned on in ages, all right? Um, so you can actually see, uh, again, you can see as the cutter moved over here, 3.17 millimeter flat at 50% uh, or 25% step over, it looks like. You can actually see the lines that it left on the part. All right. A very quick sandblast and those lines will be gone. The, the surface deviation there is sub 2 micron. Okay. Um, <coughs> now let's get on to how we chose to build this thing. I'm going to turn off the tool parts for a second so we can discuss this. Uh, I chose a very, very small cutter, a 0.5 millimeter ball end, which is half of one of these blocks here. So the physical size fits in one quarter of that quadrant over there. It's a tiny tip. All right. Now you can imagine a very tiny tip like that working in a harder material like aluminium. It doesn't want to go in very deep. It doesn't want to have to push a lot of metal because it'll snap quite easily. So you do a thing called roughing, which will come in and in various levels, remove away the metal a little bit at a time and hopefully in a fairly efficient manner. Okay, so let's open up that tool path method 
as per 2.5D, you had a drive region. If you highlight that, you'll see this was the drive region. I said I want to rough everything within this curve, the curve we selected from the previous model. Um, you can optionally pick where it starts and or you can pick the surfaces that you want to rough. We'll get into this a little bit later for roughing. In our scenario, not as important. Okay. The tool we worked with was a 0.5 millimeter ball nose in the previous uh, tutorial refer back to it on how you set that up but essentially you've got um, a setup for the tool that allows you to define a whole bunch of parameters for the tool okay feeds and speeds I took directly from the file load for aluminium 2024 I can tell you right now that this was hopelessly optimistic all right if I chased a 0.5 millimeter cutter into this aluminium at 100 millimeters a minute on a roughing pass, the likelihood of breaking a cutter was massive. I actually ran this this pass at about 50% of that or 40% of that. Unfortunately, that's something you you, you kind of learn as you go along. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Um, for the clearance plane, as per usual, I know my item is flat. I know I don't have any parameters or, or any geometry coming up here, so that clearance plane is a millimeter above the material. It's probably okay. I can tell you that within the cut time, I found this uh, pick up and down to be quite annoying and very slow because my plunge speed, in other words, the speed that the spindle comes down into material is equal to my lift speed at 50 or 20 mil a minute, which means that that extra millimeter for all the plunges that's required later on in this path added a significant amount of time that was required to, to do this cut. I could have saved half an hour by just you know, optimizing this plane to maybe 0 0.1 millimeter off of the surface. However, be that as it may, in the previous message, I said rather be safe than have to replace cuffers, cutters. So yes, I was safe. Okay. The cut parameters, I picked for roughing a tolerance. Now we did discuss this before. You've got a caudal tolerance of how the path will move over the part. So you've got an inside tolerance, how close to the path it can get, and an outside tolerance, how far from the part it can get. And both of these are set to 10 micron in this instance. Okay, but I've also built in a stock level of 150 microns inside there, saying that at no point cut any closer than 150 microns. In the back end of the software, it will produce a voxel model. I'll explain more on what voxels are in a separate, um, in a, in a separate tutorial. But it basically creates like a little skin. You can see your, your skin over here is the stock. It creates a stock over that, and then it determines how close the path moves to that stock. All right. The reason we're doing this in a roughing is a roughing tool is very rough. The calculations are a lot faster, and it can make a few errors. So sometimes it may be a little under this, a little over that. You leave a little bit of stock to remove the majority of this material, so that when you do come in for the final cut, you only have that amount of material to remove. Now, <coughs> that's a assumed amount of material because there's also step down, step over, a few things we're going to discuss over here, that each time the cutter moves down, it may actually leave a lot more stock than that, which can break cutters, all right? So, however, back, back, back to this little area. So, we've got a tolerance, which is, for jewelry purposes, quite loose, all right? 10 micron tolerance is quite loose. Um, and stock of just, you know, 1.15 of a millimeter. All right. I'm using facing cut patterns inside of here. Um, we'll go through that when we review this tutorial um, live with each other. I'll go through the difference between when this is checked, when it's not checked. Okay. But it basically is looking for faces that it can work on one at a time to sort out issues. Um, in very, very elementary cam applications, you would have very big faces defining a square edge of a part. In very organic things like this, it becomes less important, but it does help speed up stuff. All right. The methodology I chose, and this becomes quite important, all right, uh, not in the roughing as much as it is anywhere else, but offset. So find the highest part and start working in a water line from the highest part all the way down. You can kind of see it. Uh, I did it in the finishing in the finishing area. Let's find that. And you can see that it's picked a high part and it's try to follow the, the kind of flow of the model 
in different Z layers to get it right. So this over here is it's microns. So at the zoom, it becomes very, very obvious what's going here compared to the video where you can't even see it. All right. Um, but an offset, essentially what it's doing, it's finding the highest point over here. And then it's kind of working its way down to the lower points until it runs out of stuff to cut and then it will move on to the next highest point and the next highest point and work its way through the path um, once i show the tool path though, it'll be a little bit more clear all right because this is there's, there's various ways you can do this of course you could have picked a spiral and just say start in the middle and work your way out etc i like the offset when i'm working in metal because it, it kind of works from the high part down and it stops you from doing insane plunges with a cutter that will break it um, because it's roughing we don't really care what the cut direction is it can cut up and down in some instances of some materials that might break cutters running a cutter down might cause the cutter to run undue stress might break a few things in this instance mixed was fine it just means that when I've when I've come around this part here I'm going back and cutting again I could have just as well said keep in the same direction not really important here more important once we start the finishing uh, my start point is on the inside of the model or on the outside of the model so in all cases start from the highest point and work outwards don't find the lowest point and work upwards all right now the step over distance <clears throat> you can define this as a diameter of the tool or a physical distance and normally in finishing because we use more or less the same cutters i i would recommend using a distance but, but quite often for roughing you can decide that you know I'm using a three millimeter tool and I want to do a second roughing with a two millimeter tool and a second roughing with a uh, or third roughing with a one millimeter tool to get in a little bit closer. And you might want to replicate this path a few times. And if you've forgotten that it's on a on a distance setting, on a 3.17, 25% is nearly the full width of a one millimeter cutter. Okay? But not not quite, but it's so much that you would actually break a cutter in roughing. So for roughing, I like to use a percentage, and generally that percentage is suggested by RhinoCam to be 25%. There might, there might be some mathematics behind that, but it's kind of the, the distance I use. If I'm in a rush and my material is soft, like um, acrylics or wood or wax, etc., I sometimes pump this to 50 or 75% even. Uh, corner cleanup loops, not important in the case of a roughing, um, or in this case, in a roughing, not an issue. And I've chosen to always keep the tool down. So to minimize the amount of um, lifts away from the material, if possible. Right? Otherwise, what it'll do is it'll write one path, <coughs> move up to the safe Z, and then start the next one. Move up to the safe Z and start the next one. There are instances where that's fairly important. Uh, glass, ceramic, machining, it, it becomes fairly important. Okay. Um, cut levels is how many levels I said that I want to do this in. Now this is dependent on your tool, normally about 20 or 30% of your tool diameter. So if the tool is one millimeters wide, you try not to cut down more than or at a maximum 50% of the tool width. Just the amount of load on the tool tip can cause the tool to break because you're really forcing it down into metal A on, 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 your, on your push down. But then you, 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 you're cutting away a lot of material at one time and the tool is a long thin tool and the amount of stress on the top of the tool in a in a in a best case scenario will cause flex causing the tool to move around a little bit randomly through your material and worst case scenario of course the tool would break all right so more or less between that sort of 20 to 30 percent seems to be the go on softer materials you can increase this number on uh, harder materials you may have to decrease this number so Sometimes when I've cut ceramics or uh, gemstones, especially, this is a very small parameter over here. All right. Uh, rest of this, not important. I've chosen a physical top and a physical bottom, saying I want to start this roughing from 0.1 millimeter higher than the part and all the way down to 2.14 millimeters, which is a little bit above the bottom, just to make sure I've got space in there if you were using a flat cutter in this instance we're using a ball end clear flats is a good idea it'll come in it'll clear out all the flats for you 
more important than finishing pass than it is here, so not done. Engage Retract will pick how the tool comes into and out of the metal. In the previous discussion, we did discuss this. Um, path, Linear, and Helix can all be used, except for, in the case of this pathing application, it does not respect other geometry. So it'll, it'll come down, and it might crash into the wall. It might crash into a couple of different things. I've just found it safer to use a vertical approach in, 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 in these roughing passes, OK? Um, so again, your engage retract is the same thing, but your vertical approach starts from that distance. All right. Advanced cut parameters, not important over here. I do do some arc fitting because my machine supports IJK codes. Um, and smooth cut connections just means the machine doesn't jolt. So in between passes, when it's moving from here to the next path that it writes, does it kind of move in a smooth motion or does it just jolt forward? Now, I, I particularly hate things that jolt, so I usually use smooth cut connections. All right, so let's have a look at, um, let's have a sh actually have a look at that path. Let's turn it on. Okay, so I guess let's turn off the part visibility, part visibility. Let's go to the simulate menu and turn off the part visibility. Where are you? Oops, it is turned off. All right, so you can see if you look in the side here, it's gone down in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It's gone down in 14 different passes to get down. Now, I can't separate this by in, in, in the software. I'm sure there's an option in here to separate by levels. Yeah, I can separate by levels, all right, to try and see one level at a time. However, I, I can't figure out how to show you which particular level we're talking at. Um, and then what it's doing is it's going in and following the contour of the part. Now, again, this is easier to see if I actually simulate it. So let's first make sure we've got some stock. Ah, we do. All right. And I'm going to simulate that. And let's turn on our stock. Why can't I see my stock? All right, let me just stop that for a second. And let's go back here. And let's make some new stock. All right, and my stock visibility is on, and I want to simulate you. OK, no idea why it's doing that. Normally, it shows you the stock as it's cutting it. OK, well. Let's just follow that for now. And you can see in the in the very first part, it's just skipped the head of the wolf. And then it's going to go down and it's going to start working around leaving a little bit more stock. Now that video I've got simulated somewhere else. I might do that quickly for you guys while this is going. Uh, can I go back? Yes, you can see it's simulating through here. All right, so I recorded this video, which is also available in your email. And you can see that what it's doing is removing as much material per step as it can. That doesn't include the actual part and leaving a skin. So you see this little ledge over here? This becomes quite important because, yes, it's moving to within 0 0.15 millimeter of the part. But it's also leaving these big ledges out there where the tool can't get into afterwards. All right, so let's see where we're at with this. Okay, we're only to the third layer. I'm going to stop that simulation. Okay. And then the finishing does exactly the same thing. The, the two menus look nearly functionally identical. So let's turn this off. I'm not sure why it's showing it now. Um, so you can kind of see it left the top of the ear. This is, but I think the top of the eyebrow and then a little bit of the eye. And it's moved its way down in layers. All right, if you let that run for long enough, you'll see this is part of the star. So it's left that material behind, and you can see that it's quite a sloppy, it's quite a sloppy process. Not as precise as you would expect, but it is roughing. It's in there to just guff away as much material as it can, as fast as it can, okay, which is why it has a different name within the system. So if we look at the finishing path, 
you'll see that many of the menus look exactly the same. Let's give that a second to open up. Um, the only additional menu is this optimized machining through here, which I always turn on. It means between layers, if there's any material I didn't get, go looking for it. Okay. Now, the first mistake I made is inside here, I only set a 30 micron distance for the optimized XY machining between the different levels. I could have gone a little bit tighter with this. I could have gone to 10 micron, and I'll show you where that problem shows up. So let's close that. Uh, over here, you see these little lines between the layers? These are going down in Z. All right. I could have gone to maybe 20, and then there'd be 30% less lines. Or I could have gone to 10, and you'd have far less lines. But this comes as an, as an impact to actual machining time. So this thing was, I think, about a four-hour cut or something. If I had half the step over, or sorry, the, the, the step down between layers, it would have looked twice as good, but taken twice as long to cut, because it would have been twice as many layers for it to process. Okay. Um, let me see if there's a more obvious look at that. If you have a model with a lot of very flat areas, you can see that over here the 30 micron stepping becomes almost indistinguishable, but on very flat areas it becomes quite distinguishable. You know, that you've got some stepping, you can see that kind of profile happening over there as it moves its way through the model. Um, in this instance, as we saw from the video, not important. This thing looks great. To the eye, it looks great. To the microscope, not so much. Okay. A quick sandblast would fix that up. It does, outside of that, all the other parts are exactly the same, uh, the same settings. And I've set, uh, for the finishing, instead of just linear, I've come in with an angle. I've said I want to come in with a bit of an angle and let the tool warm up to the material just so that I don't get a difference in RPM if the tool hits suddenly. Where you can see that, and it thankfully it didn't happen in this path, but where you can see it generally is that, let's say it was working from here and the tool started here and it went around and then it went to the next level, and the tool always started at the same spot. Sometimes uh, if you don't set that approach vector, the difference in RPM in the tool can leave a visible line on each start-stop, and it's, it's, it's fairly visible, depending on the material you're working in. So that's the only real difference between all these paths. Um, and then the final path, which is pencil tracing. Give the machine a second to catch up with me. Is just because at the bottom here, and unfortunately I don't have a video of this, because this thing came down in levels, it may not have caught that exact corner. And in very tight places like this, you may have seen some stepping. So all this does is it detects all these sharp corners and the tool will come in and actually trace out that area. It'll, it'll physically run along that lowest line it can find and clean up the corners. Now that that's, uh, becomes quite obvious when you look at... Um, let me see if I can find one where it's more apparent. No. No. Yeah. All right. So you can see that you've got all the stepping and you've got a kind of a moya effect there and yet you have a nice clean line on this edge. That's because the cutter followed a path at a much higher resolution in this direction and physically cut away that amount of material. Okay, Let's see if I can find it anywhere else where it's more obvious. You can see it here. All right, you can see that you've got these stripes everywhere and there used to be stripes literally everywhere. But in this curved corner over here, the cutter came in and it just cleaned up that corner for me and it cleaned up all around here. Um, it does add a nice finish to the to the part. It helps define edges. Okay. Um, and then literally with these four paths in our meeting, I'll go through them more in depth to um, with you guys. But I have given you the files and I have given you the NC files. So we'll bring some wax in. We'll use the same cutter, and you can actually watch it cutting in wax. Okay. All right, guys. So this one, although I haven't done much of a tutorial on these parts or what they're actually about, you get to see some of the limitations in what we've picked. Um, we'll discuss in particular 
because I picked an offset path, it's kind of working its way from the highest point to the lowest point. Would it have been a better idea back in this software, uh, back in here? Whoops, wrong one. Where am I? Yeah. It might have been smarter for me to select all these faces together for this area and say that these are one thing, these are one thing, these are one thing, and then written a strategy to say follow the profile and cut it kind of in this angle and then move your way through and then select these sets of faces. Now in things like SolidWorks, this is pretty much the only way you can path. It is expecting surfaces to work on. It, it, it calculates using those surfaces. Um, less useful for us with those very organic parts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then you could have picked per surface the methodology you chose to cut this part. Example, something very tight like that, you may have followed along this edge, but over here, you know, in this direction. But along here, you may have chose to cut a raster cut in this direction, and through the eye here, you might have chosen a circular path just over the eye, maybe a flat path over there with a, a cut over the eye this way. Um, you got to think about finishing of your part. Now, we know because we're jewelers that when you work with these kind of things over here, Generally speaking, the buff, where can the buff get into to polish this out? And a buff always wants to polish out a thing that's the, the most resistant. So when you run a buff along a line, it tends to dig out more lines. It doesn't even it out as fast as if you're running the buff in that direction. It would smooth this out a lot. Okay, so that's also something to be looked at. Okay, so now the final thing and the biggest mistake I made in this entire path is I let the software define for me what this mesh looks like. All right, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. I'm going to mesh this part, and I'm going to pick the lowest possible. I'm going to do the simple controls. I'm going to pick the lowest amount of mesh I can. Um, and then let's have a look at that mesh. Okay, I've picked exactly the wrong example or the wrong software because this is making quads. But it's it's... Okay, so in the other rhinos, in the older rhinos, it actually makes triangles, okay? So each square you see over here, the mesh is defined by these four faces. When you get to the pathing program, the pathing program can't work with these squares. It wants to work with triangles. So it takes each of these squares, draws a line through it, and creates four triangles for a triangular mesh. Now that mesh is actually what's used to machine this part. Now you can see straight away that if the mesh is low, you can see that in my NURBS, the underlying gray, I've got a nice smooth arc through here. Because I set my mesh settings very low, you can see that if, when the machine cuts this, it would actually cut these facets. You would see this kind of chuck, chuck, chuck from here to here, more obvious maybe through here, instead of a nice smooth path, okay? So let's delete that. And then we use Shukri settings which are kind of, uh, I think, somewhere along here. Those are all zeros, and this is 0. Point. I'm going to make this 0. 0.4 and 0. 0.4, so it means force a quad every 0. 0.4 millimeters. And let's make that. And you can see that we're still there, so let's control Z, and let's do another one, and let's make it 0. 0.1. Yeah. That's not going to give me any joy, so I tell you what, let's get out of here. I'm going to control C to copy that. Rhino 7 is still a little bit flaky, guys, just bear with me. Uh, let me make a new layer. I'm working on this layer, turn that one off and control V it in here. All right, and let's mesh that. Oh, doesn't even want to work with it. Give me a second. So, uh, sub D to nerves. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I'm working in two different versions of Rhino. I can't remember which commands are working which one. Uh, wrong one still. Right one. So, let's delete that mesh. Two nerves. Ah, the command's called two nerves. There we go. All right. 
it and press enter. All right, then let's get this control C and bring it through here. Let's delete that one. Control V to bring it through here. Okay, now let's look at our mesh settings. So on a very low mesh, you saw what happened. It drew very big rectangles and on a very fine mesh, It'll take longer to produce the mesh, but that mesh is now very tight. You can see that it's following these angles very, very closely. Okay. Now the control that I have within the pathing application is I don't make this mesh. It automatically makes it from the sub D. So let's examine the outcome from that. If you watch that video, yeah, here it is here. You can see that a CNC moves with a lot of precision. Here you can see that rectangle, okay, and you can see the triangles the mesh was actually made up from, as so. So there's the next rectangle, there's the next rectangle, and the little polygons that make up the mesh. So there is also very carefully check your mesh before you start cutting. Now generally a mesh over a very curved area is always going to be pretty tight, all right. This particular area it's got a very very slight incline less than one degree from this point to this point and mesh struggles to define that no, no matter how tight you make the mesh it does struggle to define that kind of stuff because literally on the entire part this is the only area where you can see polygons in the part the surface deviation the height from here to the center of those four triangles is three micron but the mill can move to a tolerance of one micron all right, which means that you then actually get to see those triangles. Now, this shouldn't usually be an issue for you. More expensive CAM programs will mesh stuff a little better. In the case of RhinoCam, we've got uh, a very simple setting saying that I can have it standard, medium, or fine. Even on fine, it wasn't enough. So in the case where it's not fine, have a look at your simulation. And you may need to manually mesh this, mesh this before the time. The issue with manual meshing is that when RhinoCam starts plotting across this, it will draw a new junction for every time it crosses a mesh node. This means that pathing can take a lot longer. All right, like I mean, significantly longer. The subject of meshing is is a, a big subject carried by our additive RP guys, Shukri. So Shukri can take you through a lot more detail on how he gets very tight mesh where it's required and very loose mesh where it's not required. Uh, just be aware that you know this kind of mesh would give you a perfect cut first time, but it would make it would make tool pathing take significantly longer to calculate. Okay. All right, guys, pretty much that's it for this one. I think I'm going to see you guys on Thursday. Then we'll go through this in a bit more detail. Cheers.